subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. Today we're once again talking about astrobiology. More specifically, we're going to look at the possibility of life in the clouds of Venus and Venus's atmosphere. When this radical idea was first proposed in the 60s, it was met with a lot of skepticism and resistance from the scientific community. It actually took people like Carl Sagan to popularize it. In 1967, based on the latest scientific findings at the time, he had co-written a paper that explored the question of life in the clouds of Venus given the scientific data that we had. This included things like information about water droplets, water vapor, pressure, temperature, albedo, level of ultraviolet dust, ozone and many many more such parameters. Today it's a more or less accepted idea that there could be a theoretical possibility that life could exist in the clouds of Venus or at the very least the cloud tops could be potentially habitable. And now it appears that there are a group of scientists that are setting about trying to convince the scientific community to change their minds. They have analyzed the water activity in the clouds of Venus and this group of scientists has since concluded that the amount of water in the clouds of Venus is actually too low for it to sustain any form of life. In this video, we'll look at what these new findings claim and how they've been received by the scientific community. I'm Sandhya Ramesh and this is Pure Science. The clouds of the planet Venus have been a prime candidate for hospitable and favorable conditions for microbial life, at least theoretically, and since the 70s and 80s, we've been dying to send spacecraft here to study the clouds to understand them more. Of course, we also want to study the planet and the surface, but we've been astrobiologically curious about Venus's clouds. NASA's Mariner 2 was the first to fly by the planet in 1962. And the former Soviet Union's Venera 4 was the first atmospheric probe that was dropped on Venus in 1967. The plunging craft beamed back continuous bits of data and it provided the first chemical analysis of the atmosphere of Venus. That the atmosphere was primarily made up of carbon dioxide with some nitrogen. The amount of oxygen and water vapor was below 1%. Furthermore, the outermost layers of the atmosphere contained barely any hydrogen as well. Venera 4 offered the first confirmation in the form of readings of many theories that we had had in the 60s. That the atmosphere was ridiculously dense, that the planet was ridiculously hot and that all the water from the surface had evaporated. Venera 4 was then followed by other Mariner flybys and other Venera atmospheric probes. Venera 7 became the first to soft land on another planet in 1970 but it rolled upon landing. Venera 8 achieved the first successful complete soft landing on another planet. It barely lasted for about 50 minutes before it melted on the surface. We haven't sent many landers since the Venera program. Currently active at Venus, in fact, is just one orbiter, the Akatsuki from Japan, the spacecraft, not the Shinobi. Many future missions to the planet are expected to study the atmosphere too. This excitement earlier was further compounded by the detection and the subsequent discussions around phosphine in the planet's atmosphere. This is something that we've actually explored in quite a bit of detail, how first scientists thought that they detected phosphine and then how some other scientists thought that the data was wrong. There are a couple of other pure science videos on this that will be linked below. Last year, when the findings of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus made news and were announced, this news was met with some skepticism and doubt but primarily a lot of excitement from the astrobiology community. Phosphine cannot be produced naturally on the planet. On Earth, it is produced either by microorganisms, by bacteria or by humans in factories. Of the two, the former is more likely to be possible at Venus. But what is more likely to be realistic is that there's an alternate explanation or that the detection or rather the deduction that the detection was phosphine was incorrect. At least this is what many scientists believe. 
Several groups have posted rebuttals to the phosphine findings and their own alternate hypotheses. Just this year in January, there was a UK group that came up with this alternate theory that the readings that the original team had made were actually that of sulfur dioxide, which is extremely common in Venus's clouds. Some people have speculated that the dark streaks in images that we see of Venus's clouds could potentially be colonies of microbes that die and regrow. Even as phosphine results and the mathematics behind these results were being questioned, Dr. John Halsworth, who's from Belfast School of Biological Sciences, he and his team decided to first investigate if life could be sustainable in the cloud tops of Venus. To understand this, they decided to go about measuring the water content and the water activity in these clouds. Water activity technically is the ratio of the vapor pressure from the source of the vapor and the vapor pressure of purely distilled water under the same conditions. Water activity increases with temperature and things like foods with higher water activity provide enough moisture for bacteria or fungus or mold or yeast to grow when the food starts to rot. Water activity in Venus's clouds comes from sulfuric acid. But to simplify, let's just call it water content in the clouds. So the team analyzed the water content in these clouds around Venus and then they compared the amount of water that they found with the amount of water that known extremophiles need to survive on Earth. Analysis revealed that the water in these clouds is actually two or three orders of magnitude lower than the maximum known lower limit of water that extremophiles can survive on. It's more than 100 times too low. So what do these findings mean? In astrobiology, in general, even instinctively, it is much easier to say that something is definitely not habitable than to say that something could be. For something to be habitable, there is a whole host of conditions that have to be met. These include things like water and temperature and source of nutrients and so on. But to eliminate hospitability, only one parameter has to be an extreme. So the authors of the new findings use this precise logic and eliminate the possibility of life in the cloud tops of Venus. Now, Professor Jane Greaves, who is the lead author of the phosphine study from last year, has in fact voiced her support for these findings, but she has added that there are caveats. She is echoing other scientists who say that we still do not understand how well mixed the atmosphere of Venus is. This is not a new concept. We know that planetary atmospheres are not always uniformly mixed. When the Galileo probe descended through the clouds of Jupiter, when it crashed into Jupiter, we actually thought that it would send back lots of data with high humidity readings. But scientists say that the readings from Galileo looked like readings from a desert. There was no humidity. We now understand that Jupiter's atmosphere itself can have different climatic conditions like deserts and tropics on Earth and there are lots of pockets with really high water or humidity content. And this could be the case in the atmosphere of Venus too. It is possible that there could be pockets of high humidity or water which could prove to be habitable and this is what many scientists do believe. Meanwhile, the authors are also nudging the community to focus slightly on actually Jupiter too for the same reasons. They say that habitable temperatures and humidity could be found at pressures that are about five times the atmospheric pressure that is found at sea level on Earth. And they note that such conditions are met instead in the atmosphere of Jupiter and on the surface of Mars. However, of course, the study does not probe other conditions necessary for life here, such as a source of nutrients or other conditions that could degrade life, such as the high magnetic activity around Jupiter. Meanwhile, further research has already been happening with phosphine as well. Greaves and her team have in fact reanalyzed data and they are expected to either publish newer data or their responses to other scientists who've raised doubts about their original data. 
Also in the pipeline for Venus are a number of missions that are both proposed and under development. We know that NASA is sending two missions. We know that ESA is sending a mission. Russia is sending a mission which will also include a lander. And of course, India is expected to launch Shukrayaan in 2024, which will also carry an atmospheric balloon with the orbiter. So at the end of the day, we simply do not have enough data to say one way or the other with certainty about life in Venus's atmosphere. As we gather more and more data and make newer findings from the missions that are going to go to Venus, we hope to be able to definitively answer this question very soon.